My name is Giselle. This is Slow Food Live, and Slow Food Live is our way of bringing slow food into your home during this pandemic and sort of also figuring out how to connect with our friends and partners in Colorado, in New York, all over the country, all over the world. Um, this has proven to be quite an interesting and awesome platform for doing that, for connecting with our slow food community around the world. I am super excited to have the Dryland Distillery team here today. They're coming to us from Colorado. They make some really interesting, really thoughtful, and really tasty spirits, and I'm really excited to bring them to Slow Food Live. And thanks to Jody at Slow Food Boulder County for making the introduction and connecting us with them. We have the team here, so Kelly and Glenn are gonna do some cocktails with us, and then Nels and Mark are gonna answer questions and tell you more about Dryland at the end. So we're gonna say a quick hello to Kelly, and then I'm gonna jump right over to a video that introduces Dryland to you. <laughs> Hi guys. <laughs> Great. So I'm going to show a six minute video that's going to, and it's gorgeous. Our approach doesn't take shortcuts. The ingredients never took shortcuts and we're not going to take shortcuts to celebrate those ingredients. Growing up in the West made us realize that we love this place, but it's a pretty tough place to be at times. 50 below zero, up to 110 degrees, less than 15 inches of moisture a year. And so we really wanted to reflect that in our spirits with all the reward that comes from ingredients and plants tough enough to survive in those conditions. Where we're from is part of who we are. And creating spirits that are authentic representations of the places we love, that shows our respect to the lands that we, we enjoy. We are committed to using native and local ingredients, so much so that we work directly with growers here in Colorado. Mark Arnish of Arnish Farms in Keensburg, just 30 miles from the distillery, he's growing our heirloom wheat. He's also growing our Antero wheat. We are one of the few distillers in the country that produce 100% single grain wheat whiskeys, for example, one of the true original American whiskeys. For us to make a commitment to producing a single grain wheat whiskey was a big stretch. We were told we were kind of crazy by our peers. In order to make spirits, it truly is a collaboration from a lot of different partners. We can't do anything here by ourselves. I'm a third generation farmer in my family. and I've been uh, producing on these lands for nearly 25 years. And now our son Brett has come back into our farming operation, so he'll represent the fourth generation of our family farm. I think the biggest challenge was that we didn't know what we didn't know. It's a brand new wheat variety for us on our farm. We have to have our market figured out. We can't just grow a crop and expect somebody to buy it. They're willing to take the plunge into some of these unknowns with us even though they may have never ever grown that particular type of wheat before. There's evidence that the white sonoran wheat goes back 2,500 years or more in the Americas. There's evidence that it may even be the mother strain of, of many of the wheats that we see in commercial production today. I think it's changing the conversation around how we select varieties in Colorado. Our Antero wheat is a unique Colorado specific grain that we helped him save from extinction. It was just really unique to be able to see the entire length of the supply chain. In my farming career, we've always grown something that somebody bought and turned into a product that maybe two to three removed steps from our farm, the consumer eventually bought. Growing a grain and having to go to Dryland Distillers and, and automatically becoming a fantastic whiskey, that's kind of the cherry on the top of a farming career. It's the first time that I've ever been able to look at a product and go, I know where that originated. It started on our farm. That's a perfect situation, being able to network and to understand what you do and then apply those changes back to the farm has just been the most rewarding thing we've done in our farm in a long time. 
we didn't initially set out to try to use difficult ingredients. It just so happens that the ingredients that we ended up with were difficult to use. Our process is not designed to be easy. Our process begins with every ingredient in its native form. Gin is a uh, labor of love. It was a lot of trial and error, a lot of trial and error, um, a lot of experimentation, not a lot of it good. I believe that our final recipe was number 17. We have a sweeter, more approachable, definitely cocktail friendly gin using 100% native Colorado botanicals. We wanted to get all the flavors of the Western United States into a bottle. So everything from the rose hips that we use that are found in the foothills, all the way down to the sage, which is grown down in the arroyos in the southeastern corner. It was pretty important of us to bring all those flavors in so you can see the wide variety that you have in this area, in this ecosystem. I want, I want, to, I want to taste it with a little bit of water. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Nels, Aaron, and I became friends actually through our children. Our children all go to school together, and that led to adult friendships, and then that led to a business relationship. We've had a fantastic experience bringing in staff that are passionate and experienced and talented in ways that we aren't. We see ourselves as a Main Street business here in Longmont. We feel we're a part of that community and it's something that we want to continue to build on. I wanted to be able to bring to this community a sense of accomplishment and happiness like they brought to myself and my family. When somebody's having a glass of our whiskey here in our tasting room, and you can see the culmination of that work in that first sip, and you really see people's eyes light up. And for me, that part is very rewarding to see the culmination of years of work in that first short little sip that somebody has here at Dryland Distillers. Once we found Antero and the heirloom whiskey, yeah, we found our whiskey for the rest of our lives, I think. And a beautiful film. I love seeing the landscape you're working in. It's so great. And we have Kelly, who might be my match for fab fabulous earrings. So I'm oh. happy. <laughs> yes, they're very appropriate for Good. You know, I agree. ending some bar. Um, <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to you, Kelly. Awesome. Thanks. So we wanted to, you know, kind of bridge the gap from the video talking a little bit about slow spirits as a part of slow the slow food movement. Um, and there are, you know, some bullet points or covenants you, that we wanted to go over. Um, goodness or wholesomeness, um, when you're looking for different spirits that use original ingredients that are hopefully suitable to the local ecosystem. Um, it builds and fosters a healthy long-term relationship with the different suppliers. Um, as you could see, like Arnish Farms, they're amazing people and you can just tell that they take such care and love for the land and when they're producing and growing their product. Um, I think finding, finding suppliers or, you know, um, distillers who take that into consideration whenever they're making their product is huge in the slow foods. Um, movement as well as now the slow spirits movement because really spirits are a food product. Um, and then you want to look for clean where they where, work with suppliers that are good stewards of the land and the environment. Um, part of that again is going back to using native ingredients or ingredients that can be sourced as locally as possible. You want to look for um, fairness, where they're working with small growers, 
um, ideally smaller family owned businesses where you can see the care that is um, put into what they're supplying. And then um, going with that, looking at some of the practical considerations when you're going to choose the different spirits when you're going to buy them is looking at the label and seeing if it says distilled and bottled by somebody because usually if it just says bottled by, and this isn't always the case obviously, but if it just says bottled by, a lot of times what happens is it, the person who's selling the alcohol is only bottling it and not producing it there on site from um, actual original ingredients. And um, then we'll talk a little bit more about the specific spirits that we're going to be using in the cocktails and how we chose which ingredients to use in order to make that spirit as we go through and talk about each cocktail. The first cocktail that we're going to make is a desert mule, which utilizes our cactus spirit, which is made in a mezcal style. And Glenn will be walking you through that cocktail and he'll talk to you all about the process that we use to make that spirit. Welcome all, I'm, I'm Glenn, um, as Kelly mentioned. I'm the other team member behind the bar here on a regular basis in, in Dryland and Dryland Distillers. We uh, wanna welcome you to our tasting room as it is. Um, love to have you come and visit at another time, but right now this is kind of how we have to have you in. So welcome. We, um, Kelly was talking about our prickly pear that, that and, and the cactus spirit and it was kind of born and uh, the owners and Nels and and Aaron and Mark were looking for a spirit that uh, was in a mezcal style and actually thought about mezcal and, uh, but you know, agave is the main component of that and uh, agave is not much available in the US. Um, so, um, and of course, looking for an alternative for that, they came across the prickly pear through some recommendation, which turned out to be uh, perfect for uh, this particular slow spirit style because it is uh, native to Colorado. Um, and it, it does grow here, uh, as a lot of people have found when they're out for a hike. It, uh, it can, uh, it can uh, welcome you to a trail. But um, the um, prickly pear that we use is actually, there's not much commercial operation for prickly pear in Colorado. So we have a, a partner with a couple of just, um, suppliers in, in Southern, uh, Southern California and Texas. And we get some larger pads in. I wish we had one here to show you but uh, we can get some larger pads of, of prickly pear cactus. We take those and to get the um, mezcal is usually uh, just agave that's cooked over wood in a pit. And generally we uh, take this prickly pear and uh, cut it up and we cook it over mesquite for 48 hours, um, which is uh, a lot of smoke goes through that and a lot of smoke ends up on that, on that cactus. We tend, uh, and mash that up into a, a pretty fine pulp uh, through it using actually a, a little wood chipper. And then it goes into the mash. Uh, we add in some sugar and those are the two main ingredients along with some yeast. And so, uh, and it, um, it gets mashed and then uh, ferments, uh, fermentation is a couple of weeks and then uh, into the still from there. Wonderful smoky spirit is, uh, is a result of that. Um, it just has this wonderful, we, we mixable, Clarity, it is a, a just very, very fine spirit. We chose to do the prickly pear uh, and make it into a, what we call a desert mule. Um, it's our version of, of the, a lot of the mules that are out there. We use some ginger beer. Um, we take, and I'll run through the recipe in, in a moment, we take and uh, use some fresh cucumber with that and then some lime juice and some agave uh, for sweetness. And then of course some ginger beer. So without further ado, I'll walk you through that. So let me start off with a, with a shaker. Put up with a shaker and some fresh cucumber. We use a couple of slices in there, two or three, depending on what you've got going on. I'm going to use three today. Oops. And then um, we muddle those up, get all that essence out of there. Cucumber has such a nice freshness to it that, uh, and, and of course, is available uh, locally um, most of the year. In the year it's not, but it doesn't come from too far away. It definitely does like the weather here, though. The best cubes I've, I've ever grown have been where it was nice and hot and, and dry, that's for sure. So, 
we take a couple of ounces of our cactus spirit. Two is what we base our, our recipe on. Get that in there with that. We use uh, some lime juice. We In the tasting room here, we use all of our, our, our juices are fresh squeezed. Um, we go through a lot of it. Uh, fresh lime, fresh orange, fresh lemon, um, especially through our margaritas, which are also made with our cactus spirit. Um, in, the, in the course of a day, we, we, we go through a lot of them. So, but about an ounce of, uh, ounce of lime juice into there, gives that freshness. And we use an agave um, as a sweetener, as opposed to a simple syrup. We just like the, the flavor that it, it, it follows along with. It just seems to have a little bit more of a uh, parallel with the cactus spirit, um, being from this part of the town, this part of the country, excuse me. Now in our ginger beer, we use a commercial one in the tasting room. We're developing a, a house-made ginger beer. We have a, um, a bottle here that is made by a gentleman by the name of Danny Childs, I think. It's his recipe, but Jody from Slow Jody. Foods Boulder made it for right. us. So this is Danny Childs' recipe. And his, we find, is a little, uh, a little more tart than the uh, commercial one. We're using a Q uh, ginger beer with a lot of success. And that being said, we generally put in about uh, a quarter of an ounce of, of the agave. And with our experimentation today with this, we just add a touch more agave. So depending on the sweetness of your, um, of your ginger beer, you might want to adjust up and down a little bit on the agave component. Um, I've also found that uh, ginger beer having uh, some um, effervescence to it, it's not, not a, this is not a drink that you shake. You, uh, you stir this one for sure. So we, and that's through trial and error, we found that out. Um, I guess I should have chopped this up a bit, so excuse me. A <laughs> yeah. All this fresh crust ice. Okay. Exactly. So, uh, but as I was saying with the ginger beer, it, uh, you know, a lot of our cocktails we shake to get them to mix together, but we do find that um, the shake on this one can, can end up a lot more on your shirt than in the glass. So. Yeah. We just give that a stir a little bit. Um, now, what did we use in ginger beer? I think we're at about two ounces of ginger beer yeah. in our regular recipe. And the stir. You stir for a little while, just like you would for a shake with a cocktail, because it, the uh, water is the water that comes from the, a little bit of the melting ice is actually a component in the cocktail. Um, if you were to try all these ingredients without ice, you might find that they are a little extreme in one way or the other. So, certainly a little bit of uh, time on the ice is a good thing to do. We use a large rocks glass for our mule here to give that a, a strain. This gets out most of the uh, larger pieces of the cucumber, there is a little bit that makes it through, but um, that's okay. It's a, it's a wonderful flavor. And then we need that ice again. What we end up with, we do a garnish of just a, a little bit of uh, fresh lime on that and a little bit of cucumber. Trying to fingers work better. You can use your fingers at home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then for our little bit of touch, we use a, a real mild chili powder on this. It, um, it does a couple of things. It, it adds a little bit of color to the top of this drink, which is, which is fun. Uh, another, you know, chilies are all around us, that's for sure. And also the chili can just, as you pick, pick this and bring this glass to your, to, your, to your mouth, you get a little essence of that chili in your nose and it just kind of uh, adds to the drink um, per se. It, it's not designed to add a lot of flavor to the cocktail, but to the presentation and, and whatnot. So, uh, Dryland Distillers Desert Mule, wonderfully refreshing any time of the year, especially in the in the summertime. Mm -hmm. uh, the cactus spirit comes through. The cucumber uh, modifies a little bit of that smoke, and the uh, uh, just that joyous blend of of lime and and agave and and cactus comes through, and it's just a lot of uh, a lot of refreshment there. So, 
that's uh, that's my contribution today. So awesome. if you have any questions about the specific drink, I can go over the recipe again real quickly, just so you can remember what it is. But uh, we use two ounces of our cactus spirit. We use two ounces of, of a ginger beer. Uh, we, in this particular one, we used a, close to a half an ounce of, of the agave, maybe a little less than that. And then uh, about an ounce of lime juice. We used two or three uh, medallions of cucumber that we muddled in the bottom of the, of the shaker and mix that all together and then uh, uh, strain it out and pour it over some ice. So that is our uh, desert mule. It uh, kind of celebrates all the things that are around us. And uh, um, the cactus is just a, uh, a wonderful smoky spirit that uh, well, it's gaining a lot of popularity. And, and as far as we know, we're the only ones that is making this spirit in the US as well. So that's that. Um, yeah. If, so Glenn, if they don't have cactus available um, locally where they're, where they're at, what would you suggest that they use instead of a cactus? Well, you could get spirit. the cactus spirit. Um, I, to get the smoky component, I would seek out a mezcal uh, of some sort. Um, I don't have one necessarily that I recommend because I, I uh, drink cactus. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a little bias here. Yes. But, uh, but I, have, I have tried uh, a few along the way. And um, the, it, just find one that has a nice smoke component that uh, would, and it would probably take some trial and error to right. find one. And I would that, say one that has a little bit of a sweeter finish as well, um, not as oily as some mezcals that you can get. And some of them can be quite oily. So it's yeah. uh, just, and this cactus does finish sweetly um, just uh, even by itself. Uh, we, it, we have, um, it is quite popular just to, as an on the rock drink, uh, just a sipper. So it's quite nice. We do a, a, a aged version of this, a rested version of this called the Reposado as well, which uh, turns out does not work quite so well in the cocktails, but it's wonderful for shipping and just about 11 months in, in oak. So if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to, to put them in and let anybody know. We can answer specific ones about the cocktails, Kelly or myself, or if you have uh, more uh, general questions about the, the spirit in the distillery, um, Mark and uh, Nels will be able to ha happy to help you with that on a Q&A. So. Thank you so much. That looks delicious. There aren't, uh, there's one question, which is what do you call this drink? And you call it the desert mule, which is wonderful. Um, and so far, no specific questions about that cocktail. So thank you. It's a testament to a good instruction. <laughs> well, as, uh, as I said, welcome to, uh, thanks for sharing a little bit of time in, the, in our tasting room. This is where we uh, spend a lot of our time and we're looking forward to spending a little bit more now that we're going to be able to re reopen on a partial basis. But um, Please uh, feel free to ask any questions and keep us in your mind. Thank, thanks very much. What should I do with this? <laughs> I, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's happy hour. Bye-bye. <laughs> I don't want it to get in the way of the shop. Okay. Actually, I'll leave it Excellent. Oh, we do have a couple people making cocktails with you, and Alex says awesome. his tastes great, and it is wife approved. So great. perfect. Track. Awesome, <laughs> Good to hear. All right, so I will be making our whiskey sour, and we use our heirloom wheat whiskey to make that drink. Um, we touched on it a little bit in the video, but our heirloom wheat whiskey is made with a white Sonora wheat. That particular grain is like 2,500 years old. Um, it's thought to be maybe even the mother of all Western grown wheat in the nation which is just really neat. It's found a resurgence recently um, with artisanal bakers, actually, as a baking grain. Um, but as far as we know, we are the only ones distilling this grain. And it just, it makes, I mean, of course I'm biased, but it makes a wonderful whiskey. It's super approachable. Um, it's, it's on the lighter side, more vanilla, caramel notes, not as much into the butterscotch. Um, and every once in a while, like on the back end, when you breathe out after you take a little sip, you can get like a hint of coffee. Um, so it makes a great um, Irish coffee or any sort of coffee cocktail it goes really well inside of. But we are making whiskey sour. So first, we will start with two ounces of the whiskey. So if you can't get the heirloom, I would suggest going um, with a 
a whiskey of your choice. If you're more into bourbons, go with a bourbon. Uh, we have another whiskey here that is also 100% wheat, but it's our Antero wheat whiskey. And the guys at Arnish make or grow both um, our heirloom and our Antero. And the Antero is more along the way to being like a bourbon or a rye. It has more spice. It has more of the butterscotch end of the flavor profile of whiskey. And that's just dependent on the grain that you use. Alrighty, so then we will take a half ounce of simple syrup. And our simple is made just with a simple one-to-one -one ratio of sugar to water. This particular one, we use a, a, a white cane sugar. Excuse me, we use a white cane sugar just because this, um, uh, it produces a, a clear um, simple syrup, which affects some cocktails. There's other, other sugars that we use that can be colored and use different, uh, have different results and right. more flavor, but this, the, the one that Kelly is using on this one is, is made with just a white cane sugar. Yeah, we use um, a turbinado sometimes to make a heavy raw syrup, as Glenn was mentioning. And um, we have also used organic sugar to make our simple, but we find that the organic sugar adds a little bit of a caramel color to it. So for all of our different cocktails, it wouldn't so, mat so much matter with a whiskey sour because the whiskey is already brown. But with um, some of our clearer cocktails, we like to utilize um, just a non-GMO sugar that's a lot lighter in color in order to do the one-to-one, -one, just for aesthetic purposes. So then we're going to do one egg white. And feel free to just like crack an egg open and just separate the egg white right into the glass if you're comfortable with that. And then we do three drops of our house-made citrus bitters. And we make all of our bitters here in house. Um, we use different botanicals or fruits or peels, different bittering agents to make all of the different bitters. And there was talk that we might do a bitters webinar with Slow Foods Live um, about a month from now. So keep an eye out for that. If you're interested in learning more about bitters, it's a fascinating subject and um, they're really the sky is the limit with different options you have as far as bitters are concerned. So, Depending on the shaker you have, you might want to do a dry shake first, just with the ingredients without the ice, just to activate that egg white to get the right amount of foam. And if you don't have a Boston shaker, um, a different shaker will work, but it might be a little more messy. Really shaking that with egg whites on the ice can, can, for lack of a better term, kind of close them up and, and uh, just create a little bit less of the, of the creaminess and the foamy, the foamy that is a, a wonderful part of a whiskey sour. You we see go. this will have a wonderful head on it when Kelly's done with it. And yeah, with any sort of drink that has um, a foam, not really a foamy agent, but more like a Yeah, so anytime you're trying to get a nice head on a cocktail for the mouthfeel, you wanna make sure that you shake it for a long time. Shaking is fun, anyway. It is fun. <laughs> it is fun. It's a little noisy, but it's very fun. And we serve it in a small rocks glass. And we double strain. The double strain uh, eliminates um, some of the ice particles that uh, result from shaking. So you get just a, a, you don't end up with some of those extra pieces in your drink. I, you know what? I totally forgot the lemon. I'm so sorry. So I'm going to put it back in and I'm going to add the half, half of a lemon. It comes out to be about a half an ounce here. 
sour, huh? Yeah, I know, exactly. I was like, <laughs> this is not the right color. And I was trying to figure out why it wasn't. It's because it's missing half an ounce of lemon juice. So you can either um, use your own citrus press and do about a half a lemon. It'll be about half an ounce, half to three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. Either way will work just fine. And then I'm just going to incorporate that into the cocktail. <laughs> get a fresh glass. <laughs> there we go. Now it's a sour. Now it's a sour. There we go. Yeah, and the color is more of what I'm used to. There we go. Beautiful cream, mm -hmm. creamy head on that. And then we garnish with just a little bit of zest. And Glenn makes our house-made cherries. He soaks them in basically our unaged whiskey. So it's the white wheat spirit that we have here in house. We add a little bit of, um, of uh, heavy syrup to that uh, concoction yeah. as well and let them sit for about a month. And there you have it. There's the whiskey sour. Beautiful. With the lemon juice. <laughs> <laughs> So to recap, um, you're going to use two ounces whiskey of your choice. We use our heirloom wheat whiskey. It's on the lighter side. Um, if you want more backbone, go with a heavier whiskey like a bourbon or a rye. Then we use one egg white, a half an ounce of simple syrup, a half ounce of fresh squeezed lemon, <laughs> and um, three drops of our citrus bitters. You can do a dry shake and then shake over ice and then double strain into a small rocks glass, or you can serve it in a coupe or Nick and Nora glass. Oh, there you go. Awesome. If, are there any questions about this cocktail or um, any of our other spirits? I know we mentioned the gin in our video. If you guys have any questions about that, um, the reason why that particular gin <laughs> what Aaron was saying is it was it was a labor of love um, is because our gin is made with all Colorado native botanicals and as you know Colorado does not have citrus as a native um, as native produce <laughs> so trying to get a citrus finish on a gin without citrus was um, difficult and so we had to you know get acid from other native plants like rose hips and as we mentioned, um, elderberry and things like that. So, yeah. We had a question on the variety of cherry. Uh, we use, uh, we endeavor to use Western Slope uh, Colorado uh, cherries uh, as much as we can, which means uh, when they're in season, we do we do a lot of cherry pitting. Uh, yeah. They are generally a bing from out there. Um, we have some wonderful suppliers that bring them over to us uh, at the farmer's markets or, uh, and uh, it's wonderful. Um, we. Uh, sometimes find ourselves come up a little bit short so we will use a little bit of some chilean cherries but um, we just don't find that they have the color or actually the firmness that we enjoy right. so um, these uh, western slope cherries are just incredible and they're starting to come on now i know i've seen some from uh western united states they're coming into the markets now mm -hmm. so we hope that uh, the cold cold that we had early in the season won't, yes we uh, had a, we had a late frost that oh oh late hard frost so oh, yeah so we hope it didn't ding it too much we'll but, <laughs> but at any rate that's the those are the big cherries from the western slope yeah. Alrighty. excellent thank you guys those cocktails look fantastic
it's like so hot here right now, so I'm <laughs> pining for that glass on your counter. Um, you guys yeah. did an excellent job of answering questions over here. I just want to say this out loud. Um, if you're curious if Dryland distributes outside of Colorado, they're looking at mid-2021 for California, New York, and Texas, so three lucky states. Um, and um, I see that you're all really interested in a bidder's session, so heard. <laughs> Lots of excitement for that. Um, I also want to point out that if you're interested to know more about white sonora wheat, it's a really interesting, everything, for everything they've mentioned, but it's just a really interesting thing, and it's also part of our Plant a Seed campaign this year, so I put a link in the chat where we have a whole page with a podcast and the, the history of the of the plant and a lot more sort of interesting plant nerd stuff. Um, I want to say I love those cherries. I just use whatever I pick around here. I, you know, I'm no pro, but I make them sometimes. I live in Oregon. We have a lot of cherries. So um, I think it changes the drink quite a lot um, if you do them at home versus get them in a jar. Or, you know, the truly temple cherry, not the same thing. So um, we do have a couple more questions coming in. Well, just more enthusiasm for a bitter session <laughs> and the drinks awesome. in front of you. Um, I would just love to know, uh, just to touch on the gin, I know we're not making a cocktail, but what's kind of your favorite cocktail to make with that gin? Or what do you like to do oh. with it to, to play with those flavors? <laughs> so recently, um, oh, I run a, a group here called the Distilling Dames, and we meet like the second Thursday of every month. And we did spring cocktails um, as our most recent session, and there, and Jody's a part of the the Stilling Dames, so she can attest to this cocktail. But it was a lilac blush, and it used lilac simple syrup. And the cool thing about lilac simple syrup, aside from the just wonderful floral notes that you get from it, is whenever you mix it with citrus, it turns this amazing rose blush color. So we did. Um, a lilac blush, which was two ounces of gin, a muddled slice of lemon, three quarter ounce of the lilac simple syrup, and a couple drops of orange bitters, just shaken over ice and served up. And it's, I think it's my favorite spring cocktail right now. Awesome, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the bee's knees that we make here in house is also really great. It also utilizes a muddled lemon, and then we use um, some honey syrup that we get from one of our patrons actually brings us in fresh honey from her bees, and that's what we use to make our honey syrup. Um, and then it's, we use our oleosaccharum that we make here in house, which is basically like the, the sweet drippings of a sugared orange or citrus rind. So we use lemon oleosaccharum and orange oleosaccharum in that drink, and then some orange bitters because we don't have an orange liqueur that we make here in the distillery and everything that we serve in the tasting room has to be made in house. So in order to come up with that orange flavor, we use the oleosaccharum to kind of balance that out um, in, in the absence of a liqueur. And then that is also shaken with some aquafaba, which is basically a vegan alternative to egg white. And it's also served up. So yeah, the bee's knees. Sounds delicious. Um, I, I wanna say that I actually, we have a recipe for oleosaccharum, which I wasn't familiar with until we pulled it into a sort of digital cookbook we did. So I'll put a link in here. I'll, sh I'll share that in the follow-up email to everybody on this call. So if you are interested in making that at home. Um, that's really interesting that everything you serve has to be made in house. It's, it seems like it's your instinct anyways. Um, and so I'm curious about kind of your plant inspiration. You're making bitters, you're doing stuff with citrus. And um, I have two questions that I'm going to ask you. Okay. One is the whiskey. I would love if you can tell us more about like um, your distiller said, everybody said we were crazy to use this one whiskey. Why is that? And why was it important enough to do it anyways? <laughs> well, I think this is more a question for Nels. Okay. And you guys are coming on anyways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to. <laughs> I know, you're doing really Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
Hey, everybody. Uh, Glenn and Kelly are there because they make us look really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> Mark's going to be up here next with me as well. Um, but there are a couple of questions about the distilling process as well as, as the ingredients we chose. And it's a great question. And I, I would love, love to say that there was a really easy answer on why we chose what we chose, but there's not. Um, we looked at a number of things that influenced how we shape our spirits program here. The most important thing, we felt like nobody was doing Colorado and the West justice in any of the spirits. I mean, there's lots of great spirits out there, lots of wonderful craft distillers, but there's also a lot of pictures of mountains on labels, um, pictures of, you know, of Colorado, the West, but we didn't feel like anybody really captured what should be in the bottle um, to be truly uh, representative of, of Colorado. So that's kind of what started the journey of, okay, well, if we really do want to capture Colorado, what should we look at the ingredients? And that's where we, we started to, to come across um, ingredients like the white Sonora wheat, which is perfectly suited for uh, Colorado. Um, also on the, the gin that we felt like if we were going to create a gin that is really about the Western US and about Colorado, why would we use anything that was not native to the, those, the state? And what we learned pretty quickly there is that the botanicals that we have to work with in our gin are really, really difficult. They're not only difficult to work with, in fact, um, I, I, I guess I can't use curse words, but there were times when I would like to uh, <laughs> talking about that. Um, but they're also really difficult to find because not many of them are grown commercially. And of course, foraging is something that we just won't do um, unless it's foraging in our backyards or my sister's yard, um, which is, or, or neighbor's houses where we know we can get the ingredients safely. So it was a complicated answer to why we chose what we chose, but ultimately it boils down to we are very, very conscious and very selective that we are, want to use ingredients, um, plants, botanicals that are native to the state. Um, and even if they're not grown locally, like if we can't get prickly pear cactus, for example, we can't get it from a local grower. Um, we get that from Western, Western growers um, because we, we, we just really truly wanted to, to bring the West into the bottle. So kind of cliche, but I think we've actually done a pretty good job of it. We're, we're kind of proud of it. So does that answer your question sort of? Yeah, definitely. I think that my curiosity is like, why, why is it hard to work with? But I, I love and appreciate what you just mentioned. And I think that this is kind of where the slow spirits idea comes in, that we just have this history of not thinking about alcohol and spirits in the same way we think about food. But at the end of the day, these are agricultural products. These are being either crafted or mass produced. And, and the, that's the difference therein. And then I feel like you guys are taking it a step further to get into the botanicals and plants from your area and your landscape. Um, you know, I think that's just my curiosity, like what makes it so difficult, makes you want to like curse at it. You know, we're not an yeah. and it's happy hour, yeah. so you probably just go for it, but. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a great question. I mean, the, the grain itself, um, it's a gorgeous grain. The white sour wheat is gorgeous. I mean, we stumbled across it when we were also doing a lot of baking. Uh, but what we learned is that it's super finicky to grow. It loves things that, that most of our commercial wheats don't love. It loves heat. It loves dry climate. Um, adding too much water in our first year of trying to grow it made the crop collapse. Um, so it's been very frustrating for our growers to really get a handle on because it is so old that it just, it, it just, wants to grow and do its own thing. So trying to manage it, I think has been more difficult for our growers. And for us, um, working with a grain where the protein structure is quite different than most of the modern grains, uh, right. the enzyme structure is also quite different than most of our modern grains. And the combination of those two mean that what we would normally do today using modern grains in making beer or whiskey didn't really work very well. So we had to kind of learn, we had to go back to the, the roots. That was a really, not even an intentional pun. <laughs> yeah, we'd go back to the roots of the problem and, and rebuild a recipe to really make this grain give us the, the yields that we needed. And also, the protein structure is so unique and the enzyme structure is so different that when we um, mash it, which is basically cooking the grain at different temperatures, um, more often than not, when we first started, we would get a gigantic pot of really <laughs> thick, gooey cream of wheat. Like forage. Forage, which is not what you want. 
All I can say is I'm glad I have kids because they get to help clean out some tanks every once in a while. <laughs> but so we had to learn how to how to crack the code again on um, some of these grains and, and ingredients that are so old that they just don't they don't they just don't work the same way that a lot of yeah. the modern grains do. And then on other uh, ingredients that, that was frustrating, you know, harvesting from people's yards or trying to figure out, or, or and we first started to work with prickly pear cactus. Prickly pear cactus, as you can imagine, is what the curse words really, because our hands, when we first started to work with this stuff and the thorns, we were literally, it was, it was not, it, I have scars on my hands still. <laughs> So those are the curse words problem. So, so the ingredients are not easy to work with for, for, for many, many different reasons. Um, even the botanicals, like we have one of the botanicals in our gin that we, we love, which is a wild form of chamomile. You've probably heard of it. It's uh, pineapple weed. Nobody grows pineapple weed. So I call my sister, Jenny, whatever you do, don't spray your yard and don't pull your weeds. I'm coming over. So, <laughs> you know, she's like, you want my weeds. Okay. So, yeah. you know, those are the things that make it difficult. A lot of fun, a lot of challenge, but it's worth it. So. Right. Well, and even, I mean, maybe talk a little bit about how you had to come up with the different yeast working with a lab for the heirloom and the Antero is, sure. is interesting, I think. Yeah. So because we were, we had a grain on our hands that just didn't act like normal grains at the time, which are, this is kind of ironic because wouldn't they be the normal grains? They were cursed. Anyway, because it didn't act normally to us, uh, we ended up having to do uh, lab analysis to really understand the different enzyme structures and um, also understand the protein contents and the sugar contents. But then we found that most of the commercial yeasts that we would use in distilling and brewing, they didn't like the wheat either. So we ended up working with one of the, um, the yeast uh, companies to try to figure out how do we how do we take one of our yeasts and make it like the, the wheat? Uh, at some point, and I will never forget this quote, when we were in with our lab team trying to figure out how do we make this work, and she said, well, you got to go chasing a pink unicorn here because I don't think it's possible. <laughs> so we ended up having to ultimately design our own strain of yeast where we had to inoculate our original um, fermentations using raw grain from the field to make sure that we got some of the natural yeasts that were naturally attracted to the grain. And, and now we actually hand harvest our yeast for each strain in order to keep our, our, uh, our fermentations rolling. Awesome. So we have a question here. Do the botanicals grow for the gin all year long or do we use different botanicals for different seasonal gins? Great question, and that is what's so much fun. We we get to do seasonal gins. We we only do two seasonal gins. We do what we call our spring slash summer gin and our our winter gin. Um, we actually use the same recipe for both the spring and summer as well as the winter gin. But because we're harvesting things like um, spruce tips, for example, my spruce tree right now I'm harvesting all the young beautiful uh, spruce tips that are coming out in the spring. They're so, I mean, you can put them in a salad. So they, have, they provide a very different flavor profile than uh, in the fall when we harvest for our gin. Same tree, mm -hmm. but we're harvesting the mature spruce. So a lot, same with the rose hip. With the rose hips in the spring, in the early summer when we harvest, they're big, plump, you know, juicy, bright. Um, they pop with you know, citric profile. And yet in the fall and winter, um, after the, they've evaporated and, and, they, and any sugars they do have are concentrated into, those, into the rose hips, it creates a much richer um, profile. So there is some significant difference between, or can be significant difference between uh, our seasonality of our, of our, our gin. So it's, that's been a lot of fun. Awesome. I don't know if you can answer this or not, but- Well, oh, that's what Mark should. <laughs> Elizabeth wants to know if she should plant her Sonoran wheat early in fall in South Carolina or Mark. where <laughs> fall is, where fall is the driest season. I'm going to get Mark up here for some of these. <laughs> That's a, oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry. So I get uh, you know, thanks. Um, yeah. So I'm not really sure how to answer that question. What I can tell you is out here in Colorado, first of all, I think what I would do is I would contact the state's um, the State Growers Association, um, and I don't know if, if uh, University of South Carolina perhaps has an ag program as well uh, that might be a little bit better suited to tell you the conditions for South Carolina. 
here in Colorado, our wheat actually goes in the ground. Um, it goes early, uh, early January is when our was when Mark Arnish put it in this year. I was out at the farm about two weeks ago, um, so mid mid May, and at that point, our wheat was about this tall, so about maybe eight inches to a foot tall, and so it's really a pretty slow growing wheat, at least in the springtime. But then as you move into summer, um, it's gonna become very aggressive. It's gonna to start to look like a wheat field that you would find in the Midwest. And then Mark's gonna be harvesting that, hopefully in July and more towards the end of July. Very hot, very dry conditions. The wheat will have had an opportunity to dry on the stalk. Uh, he'll cut it. Um, he'll do a little bit of uh, cleaning right there on site in the field. And then it goes straight over to our malter, just about 30 miles from here in, um, in uh, Fort Collins, and then they will uh, rehydrate the grain. They'll start to sprout in just a little bit. Uh, then sadly, they kill off the tiny little sprouts. They'll do a little bit of debearding, dehydrate it, rebag it, and then uh, they'll be shipping it down here to us uh, for use here at the facility. Alrighty. Gosh, I, I don't. I didn't answer her question at all, but hopefully, I just <laughs> around it. So sorry about that. But I, I do think the ag extension she is probably the best. <laughs> the ag extension really is the best folks uh, to talk to. And, and you know, that brings up a really interesting point um, for us here in Colorado, and maybe it's a little bit of an unusual partnership, but we do a lot of collaboration here. There's not a whole lot that we do just on our own by ourselves with good ideas. We have a tremendous network of partners here that you may not really think about that a distillery would be, would be tapping into, into on a routine basis. But for us, one of those is the Ag Extension at CSU, Colorado State University. We have some really terrific partners up there who have been advising us pretty extensively, not only on the wheat, but also on our prickly pear cactus. Prickly pear cactus is a terrific crop for Colorado, but like you heard Mark Arnish talk about early on in the video, farmers just don't put plants in the ground hoping that somebody will come along and buy the crops later on. And we experienced that early on in our distillery career as well, trying to find a commercial grower of prickly pear cactus, at least right around the distillery here in Colorado is really challenging. And if you go and talk to a farmer and you say, hey, Bob, hey, Jim, would you be interested in plowing under your really profitable lot of corn and throwing some cactus in the ground for us to come back <laughs> and buy in a couple years? The looks you get, uh, and we come back to that whole swear word conversation, but uh, the looks you get are, uh, are nobody's willing to plow under corn and plant cactus, at least right around here in Col and uh, right around us here in this area of Colorado. Okay, so how do the tastes of the two gins differ? Uh, well, I should probably taste them right now. And see. <laughs> <laughs> Just to see. Well, Kelly, what, what, do, what do you think, Kelly? You're uh, our, so the one spring, of our alchemists here. The spring gin is an extremely delicate gin. Um, it's very light on the botanicals. It's great for a martini where you're, you, you want to really taste the gin. It's a great sipper. Um, and I think that the winter gin is much more suitable to most cocktails yeah. because the botanical um, flavors have more of a punch. Yeah. And and really with either of these gins, they're not going to be the like spruce in your face kind of right. um, gins that some of you might be used to. Both of them are probably delicate on the spectrum of gins in general, but our winter, it has more pronounced botanical flavor for well, sure. And, and if I may make a comment about that, um, you probably think I'm a little crazy as a distiller talking about this. Um, but I'm always disappointed when I order a martini at a uh, restaurant or at a cocktail bar somewhere because it tastes so much like gin. <laughs> <laughs> and what I mean is I'm disappointed personally because it has such a pronounced juniper flavor on it. And for me, that taste can be a little bit of a turnoff or overpowering and doesn't make a very enjoyable cocktail. But here's where our gin is a little bit different because it is so light. Um, it makes, for me, a really superb martini or a terrific Gibson, which is a cocktail onion substitute instead of the olive. And it's just a really refreshing drink. And I often remark here in the tasting room when we're talking to customers, I don't feel weird about sipping this gin on my back porch uh, when I'm not here 
working. <laughs> this, I mean, it's, 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 it it, I wouldn't go to a liquor store and buy a bottle of gin deliberately for sipping with a little bit of ice in a rocking chair on a back porch. But our gin does that, and it's just so light. It's just such a fun sipper. Um, and because it's so delicate, we have to be a little bit careful with the cocktails. Well, and the, and the base of our gin comes from, our, from the wheat. It's, it is actually from the whiskey. So um, I think that there's like a slight, you know, grain flavor to it as well, which makes it a better yeah. sipper. In well, my and I could already hear like the wait, what <laughs> happening in the background right there. So uh, not a trade secret here, but a gin starts with a base spirit. It gets run then through a botanicals basket. And you heard us talk about our botanicals. And as that vapor passes through the botanicals and then hits a chiller, it drops out as gin. Um, a lot of distilleries use a neutral grain spirit that they purchase commercially. Uh, they make a really fantastic gin with whatever botanicals that they're using. But here, uh, the neutral, the spirit that we're using as that base spirit is uh, originally that heirloom wheat uh, whiskey. Um, and it's, uh, it's just the alcohol that we couldn't get uh, all the whiskey portions out of it. And there's still some great alcohol in there. We run that through our gin basket and it drops out such a, such a lovely gin. Other questions? Mm -hmm. um, there's not too many other questions. This is awesome. so interesting. <laughs> I find this so interesting and exciting, honestly. Um, and I think that everything you're saying is really part of this impetus to like, think about it. You know, it's not right. just the bottle of the liquid. There is a lot of craft and thought and ingredients. And um, I can see in the chat that folks are really liking this. And I think that it's really important and helpful. And, and then now choosing the liquor that you have available to you, whether it's in Oregon or if I was in Colorado, I'd come right to you. But it's <laughs> helpful to have this, like, this extra information to understand really the stuff of the liquor that we're buying. And also somebody mentioned the cocktail mixers, you know, all the stuff that you guys are making in house that the commercially made stuff has just got all kinds of other things in it. <laughs> it absolutely know. does. Uh, you know, and to your point, I've tried to make a margarita at home with our cactus spirit, um, utilizing a commercial uh, regular mixer that you might find in a grocery store <laughs> at your, at your favorite liquor store. And, um, the results are not the same. When you use right. the fresh uh, natural juices, the orange juice, the lime, the lemon, um, you really get, in, in my opinion, a, such a better cocktail and it doesn't take very much more effort. Yeah. And another thing about that, I think, is not to encourage overconsumption, but, you know, when you drink a cocktail made with your cactus and house made, but, you know, the things that are made in house that don't have a lot of other junk, I would wager you will not feel the same the next day. <laughs> like that, I, you know, sometimes you drink a cocktail that has the, the junkier stuff in it. And I don't know about you, but I feel terrible. <laughs> but I drink something like your cactus, I put it in a cocktail. It's different, you know, I think because it's less about what alcohol isn't going into your body, just the ingredients in general. It's the same difference with food. You know, if you're buying packaged and processed yeah. foods or are you making something at home, how does that make your body feel? It's different. I, you know, I, and that's a really terrific point, and maybe I'll get off the stage here kind of with this comment, but what I would say is that um, find your, you know, as you're looking at different products in the liquor store, um, there's a lot of really good stuff out there, and then there's a lot of stuff that maybe you don't want to spend your money on either, but you should become a, maybe an informed consumer because the details really are on the back of the label, um, and Kelly hit it on a little bit earlier. Um, I would just understand what all those different terms are. Um, but when you see produced by um, or, and distilled by, those words really do have meaning about who's making your spirits. And you can actually maybe have a better conversation with either your local bartender or perhaps even the liquor store employees just to figure out um, what might be a good fit for you and, and what might not be um, as, you're, as you're strolling through. Yeah, I think that's great. We're gonna follow up with all of you with a little sort of a mini guide so some, some of the things that Kelly mentioned and that we're mentioning today, like what should you look for on that label and what do those things mean so that you can go choose your, choose your next best sure. liquor if, you, if you're not in Colorado. <laughs> 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 well, 
Well, and of course, we would love to see you um, at any point in time here. We're starting to get our tasting room opened back up here, and we're pretty excited. We're really excited about that, um, uh, just really because we really miss the interaction with our customers here and being able to have a conversation just like this uh, in our tasting room about some of the terrific spirits we're making, some of the great ingredients that we use. And uh, we, we would really love to have you here at some point, but we're also open at any point in time uh, via email or a phone call to have a discussion about what you might want to be looking for. So who am I turning this uh, stage, this platform over to here? Well, I want to honor your time. We're right on the hour here. So I want to, I want to honor your time. I know you guys have something going on just after this. Um, you know, I want to make one more comment on the importance of what you're doing with encourage with sort of giving farmers a reason to plant these less common varieties, which is that it contributes greatly to biodiversity, that that, that amount of acreage going into a different crop, a different variety is really good for the environment. It's really good for the earth. That's a major tenet of slow food is just biodiversity and the importance of it. Um, but at any rate, Colorado is kind of first on my list when, when traveling is a thing again, because we have a, we have part of our team there and we're not able to have our festival this year, but I've, I can't wait to come visit the team. So maybe we'll come visit you when you're open again and we can move around like that. And I can't wait for that day. And I really appreciate all of you guys and all of your time today. Um, all four of you that we saw and Tim in the background and maybe someone else in the background. So we really appreciate you. We'll follow up about a bitters class because I can tell you're all really excited about awesome. that idea. So let's run with that. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, for offering up your time and your wisdom and sharing this. This is really fantastic. And thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much for having Thanks. us. It was a blast. Thanks. We had a great time. Thank you. Great. Me too. And I'm going to sign off and go make myself a desert mule. So. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> We're going to drink ours. Great. <laughs> Cheers. I'll toast to dry land. <laughs> okay. All right, everyone. We'll see thank you next time. Job. Keep up with Slow Food Live. We've got this kind of happy hour thing going a few more in June and then we'll hope to get dry land back in July or August for bitters. So be well, be safe everyone and thanks again to the dry land team. Y'all are wonderful. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.